Um, Dylan uh, was also a, 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 a philanderer, which as far as we know, Sadat Hassan Manto was not. Um, they both died. You know, interestingly, the autopsy report in New York of uh, after Dylan's death uh, clearly indicated that he did not have cirrhosis of the liver. So, you know, and that's what led to all of the, uh, you know, speculations about whether he'd been killed or killed himself or, or whatever. Uh, the other thing, you know, apart from the creativity and the genius and the alcohol was the fact that these two women, you know, Caitlin and Safia, who were very, very important to their creativity, were almost entirely absent uh, from s subsequent accounts. And in fact, much more so for, for uh, Sadat's wife. It's not until Nandita Das's film last year that we got to know a little bit about her. And if you Google her, you will still not find much. There's one article by Nandita in Scroll.in which talks a little bit about her. Uh, Caitlin, of course, has received greater publicity. Uh, thanks in large measure to your work, and I, I hope some of you will have seen Caitlin, or if you missed it like me, catch the YouTube video. Uh, and uh, so, so these, these silenced women, and finally, uh, the fact that both of these writers somehow became greater than their writings. So Dylan Thomas is become so good. So a, a lot of people know about him, and he's this figure, you know, portrait of the artist as a young dog, uh, drinking, womanizing, dying young. He was 39 when he died. Robert Earl Zimmerman, young lad from middle America, takes on his name, begins to call himself Bob Dylan as a result. And Sadat Hassan Mantu will be remembered for obscenity and for this man who strangely went off to Pakistan where Bollywood was waiting for him. And in that sense, you know, a lot of their work has sort of gotten obscured. So I would request Caitlin, you know, we are very hospitable to visitors. If you would care to sort of kick off the proceedings by, you know, maybe reciting something about, by Dylan Thomas, talking about your experience of producing and, and being Caitlin. Okay, the mic is on. Mike is on. It is not on. This is on. <laughs> Hello, the mic is on. Um, this is the last uh, verse from Fern Hill, of which I know two of the last lines, and I'm ashamed to say, in a way, that these are the only two lines that I know of Delon Thomas's work. But here we go. <laughs> Nothing I cared in the lamb white days that time would take me up to the swallow thronged loft by the shadow of my hand in the moon that is always rising. Nor that riding to sleep, I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. Yeah, what, do these lines, emotional, like, what do these lines say to you? Well, um, they are quite apart from my own culture in a sense, because from a poem, all the work of Dylan Thomas, I think uh, school children such as myself, very early on, would have learned that there is a, uh, there's a it's an official Welshness in a way, because Dylan Thomas is a Welsh writer who wrote in English. And um, where I am from, there are Welsh children who speak Welsh, so there's a, there is a divide anyway. He's from uh, the very south of Wales, where the Welsh language was not so spoken. Even though his parents both spoke Welsh, they did not pass did the language on to him. Yeah. So there's a, there was a conflict there. And so what I saw was a, a, a glamorous uh, South Walian figure which, um, in which taught me about my rural culture, e even though, of course, he had experiences of the rural culture, but he didn't live it in the same way as, uh, as you you know, the generation from the 60s onwards had, had lived it, as I had in school. So that's what my poem, that's what that poem reminds me of, is of what I think of as a romanticized uh, officialese uh, version of, of Wales. Yeah, I love the rhythms and the... And the lilt. Oh, the lilt the is everywhere. The <laughs> lilt and the rolling and arse. Yes, and that, that, that's another thing. That, <laughs> yes, that, yes. That, you know, as a Welsh speaker, you think you're always quite used to people saying, 
oh, you've got a lilt and you sound musical, and so very often you try and work against that. <laughs> but it's difficult, you know, you yeah. don't work against that. It's there, isn't it? And it's yeah. supposed to be there, so you render it there. And, and, if you, and if you heard her carefully, you will see that the Welsh accent comes fairly close to the Bangla accent, you know. What is your name and where are you going? Now, I've had people ask me if I'm from Wales when I was in England as a, as a, as a fair, and I kept saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not Welsh, I'm a Bangali, I'm a Bengali. And it, it's true, because when I've been to Wales and I've spoken to Welsh people and they speak English, they have that sort of, you know, and the dropping, the tail dropping and things like that. Uh, so Kavita, will you give us something about okay. by, uh, and it would be nice if it could be in, in Urdu. Yeah, lovely. Uh, I have to say, I've been asked whether I'm from Ireland, not Wales. Okay. So, <laughs> near enough. Uh, no, I think uh, the ways in which we are attracted to la certain languages and the cultural baggage of those languages or everything they carry with them, I think there's a lot of echoing here in different ways because uh, one of the things that we still treasure about Manto is the kind of Urdu he wrote in. Because Urdu is a language we are losing out on. Urdu was a ling you know, one of the lingua francas of North India. And after partition and the segregation of languages also, Urdu is being distanced more and more as a language of the Muslim community, as a language of Pakistan. Of course, Pakistan, Urdu was not uh, originary to Pakistan at all. None of the provinces of Pakistan speak Urdu. But Urdu has become the language of Pakistan and India has left with Sanskrit. So, uh, of course, we keep reclaiming our languages. We are not going to let Urdu go away. And I think it's on that note that I'll start by reading a couple of things from Manto. But just a little bit of background on Manto before that. Many, many of us have read Manto or seen Toba Teik Singh or seen the recent film. But uh, just to recapitulate once, uh, one of the most important things about Manto was his extreme sensitivity to his times. And uh, if there's any writer who's captured the partition in all its starkness, in all its power and in all its goriness, then it's Manto. Completely unsentimental and completely powerful. It's from the gut and it hits you in the gut. So uh, I'm going to read out a little bit from this book called uh, Black Borders, which is actually Siya Hashiye in Urdu. And I've got these old-fashioned things called books because they're nice to hold and, and all that. Yes, yes. But given this breeze and the fact that these are very well-used books, the pages are going to fly. I'm going to turn to my phone because I've got them here. So uh, I'm going to start with the epilogue to this book. And this book, uh, Siya Hashe or um, Black Margins, Black Borders, is actually set in the times of the partition. And they're little snippets of what Manto witnessed and what he, him writing about what he witnessed. But I think the dedication itself will tell you a lot. He says, Us admi ke naam, jisne apni khureziyon ka zikr karte huye kaha, jab meinne ek budhiya ko mara, to mujhe aisa laga, mujh se katl ho gaya hai. So he's dedicating it to the one person who actually felt like a murderer after he'd murdered a woman. An old woman. And uh, I'll read it in English also. To that man who, while narrating his many misdeeds, said, when I killed that old woman, I felt as though I'd committed a murder. I'm going to read out one or two little snippets from here more, one or two snippets more, to give you an idea of the kinds of things that Manto wrote. And that will actually lead us into the discussion because you get a sense of what it is that Manto is witnessing that's so deeply disturbing. It's a complete distortion of the human personality. Uh, this one's called The Fruits of Ignorance. Okay, I'll read jelly first. It's jelly, as in the jelly we eat, right? Subah chhe baje, petrol pump ke paas, haath gaadi mein, barf bechne wale ke chura, barf bechne wale ke chura dhopa gaya. सात बजे तक उसकी लाश लुक बिछी सड़क पर पड़ी थी और उस पर बर्फ पानी बन बन कर गिरता रहा गिरती रही सवा सात बजे पुलिस लाश उठाकर ले आई बर्फ और खून वहीं सड़क पर पड़े रहे फिर एक टांगा पास से गुजरा 
बच्चे ने सड़क पर जीते जीते खून के जमे हुए चमकीले लेथरों की तरफ देखा उसके मुंह में पानी भर आया अपनी माँ का बाजू खींचकर बच्चे ने उंगली से उस तरफ इशारा किया देखो मम्मी जेली द इंग्लिश वर्जन एट सिक्स इन द मॉर्निंग सम वन नाइफ अ मैन हु सोल्ड आइस फ्रॉम अ पुश कार्ट नियर द पेट्रोल पंप एंड किल्ड हिम टिल सेवन हिज बॉडी ले ऑन द रोड वाइल आइस फ्रॉम द कार्ट kept dripping over his body and forming a puddle on the road at a quarter past 7 the police came and removed the body but the ice and blood remained on the road a tonga passed by a child riding the tonga looked at the half congealed puddles of fresh red blood his mouth watered he tugged at his mother's sleeve and pointed see mummy jelly I'll read just one tiny one more just because this will help us talk a little more about the question of obscenity that Manto was charged with and uh, the ways in which and I'll I'll read that one just in English to save time. Uh the kinds of things that Manto wrote about women and this is just the tip of the iceberg. It was known that Manto uh had deep empathy for people on the margins but also specially women who were exploited in society and he spent a lot of time with sex workers understanding their sorrows learning about them and of course what happened during the partition in terms of what the kind of uh, violence each community wreaked on the women of the other there's just one little piece here it's called losing proposition the two friends finally picked out a girl from the dozen or so they'd been shown she cost 42 rupees and they brought her to their place One of them spent the night with her. What is your name he asked. When she told him he was taken aback. But we were told you were of the other religion. They lied, she replied. The bastards cheated us, he screamed. Selling us a girl who is one of us. I want my money refunded. Um very difficult uh, and but i think it it tells you uh gives you a hint of the sort of things that art can do or literature can do with you cannot always do from mere uh history as it were and uh, when i was asked to to sort of you know babble in this session uh, i was thinking of uh, dylan thomas's poetry is one of my favorite poets and i thought of one called clown in the moon have you have you heard or read clown in the moon it's a short poem and the reason why i am also joining the the poetry recitation uh, <laughs> uh competition here is because a it's short and b in a sense it also it could be a description of manto by thomas and this is like it, it goes like this my tears are like the quiet drift of petals from some magic rose and all my grief flows from the rift of unremembered skies and snows i think that if i touched the earth it would crumble it is so sad and beautiful so tremulously like a dream and it is in a sense when they touch the earth i mean uh, uh, dylan thomas may not have uh, witnessed partition but he did see the second world war you know participated in this he didn't he escaped he escaped oh, yeah but he saw so it yeah <laughs> he True. made sure he didn't get into the <laughs> yeah. army by turning up completely drunk to completely, the uh, yeah, yeah. to the recruiting session i think yeah. but he lived through this tremendous period of violence so uh, let me let me uh, turn to eddie and ask her uh, what do you think is the connection between violence uh, alcohol and creativity because three okay. all of these three figure in both both the cases i don't think you need alcohol for creativity i know some people who do not drink and who are creative i used to wonder myself is if i took some drugs maybe i would be even more creative Did i it never work? well i don't know <laughs> I, t- i talked a lot um violence i think it, if we think of these things as necessary for creativity i think we're in a lot of trouble really aren't we i think violence is inherent in our condition um and so being violent does not necessarily make you creative um i think alcoholism uh, alcoholics that i know tell me 
that it does not help them in their lives whatsoever. Um, they, re they think of it as an evasion of responsibility in a way, or of actually getting on with, with your life. And I think with Dolan, I think it's, although we don't believe in geniuses landing on you, I think his talent in some sort of way does land on him. And as Caitlin herself says, the mix of his talents or well, the mix of his background might not have resulted in Dylan Thomas. It might have resulted in someone who could write his name with a cross on the paper just because his parents were who they were. But I think, I think his, his, his talent is probably a, a, a stroke of luck, as she said. Mm. Doesn't make it any, any less valid. But I think if we think that there's a recipe of violence and uh, what else no, is it, I, alcoholism I, that will lead you to creativity, it, no, I'm, you know, I, you know uh, Eddie, I, when I use the word violence, I don't mean it in a literal sense like of bashing someone up. Because what I find, something else which is common to both Manto and uh, Dylan Thomas is that they were able to reshape the language in ways. You know, I'm thinking of a poem like Do Not Go Gentle Into the Good Night or whatever. So, so it, it, you know, it, so it was what Eliot says in, I think, Tradition and the Individual Talent that a poet, if necessary, must, you know, break the language with violence in order to, to convey meaning. I think, this, um, I think we're straying now into this world of patriarchy where we think of if something has to be achieved, it's got to be broken. Just like when they talk about women, when they're supposed to be broken. At the, no, you, know, in, you know, it's like, why, why are these things? This, this is entirely, let's break in, let's break it apart, let's reform it, let's break it again, you know? And I think, um, obviously I'm brought up in that tradition, I don't know anything else apart from breaking stuff up. But what, is, what else is there that can lead us, that, that does lead us into creativity, but that we still keep terming it as violent? So why is reforming language, why do we think of that as a violent thing rather than it happens or something, you know? We think of it that we have to be so actively engaged in shaping it into something else. Um, I, I, th I, I just think that we are, um, we're, we're products of our time in thinking that, aren't we? Right. Uh, how would you respond to that? Because I think that women, uh, to have to, you, you know, when there are structures such as patriarchy and you're, you're reacting against it, in a sense you have to commit violence, although that may not be the violence that, that is, you know, normal to us. I mean, women who are broken through and, they're, they're, and Kavita has done incredible work on the silenced voices of women in Tebhaga, uh, you know, how would you respond I to that? I think I'll um, locate this uh, closely in Manto's own life and go uh, first to the whole question of uh, violence that's not physical violence, but uh, the violence that people inflict on each other, which there was incredible amounts of during the partition, because the first, the first violence that took place with words was the ways in which meaning changed drastically. And uh, this came out even in the little epitaph that, uh, epilogue that I read out, where the guy who's killed a woman says, I think I've murdered somebody meaning that generations lost out on the meaning of what murder means, at least the ones involved in the riot. Or uh, when the little kid looks at this gooey mess and says it's jelly, right? So the meaning of words has been violently transformed already. But the, what's also happening is uh, people's relationships with each other are transforming violently. Manto's closest friend in Bombay when he was working in uh, Bombay cinema was uh, a star called Sh Sundar Shah Mahuja. Sundar Sham Chadda. They were really, really close, and they'd gone to meet a Sikh family from Rawal Pindi once. And this family sat there and narrated to them the absolute horrors that they'd been through in finding their way to India. And uh, Sundar himself was from Rawal Pindi. He was very disturbed when he heard all this. When they were coming back, Manto turned to him and said, if I'd been a Muslim, I mean, if, if, if I'd been a Muslim, you didn't know. And if I'd been there, would you have killed me? He's, this guy looked at him, his closest friend looked at him and said, yes, then maybe I would have, not now. And Manto says his response was, I could have killed him right then and there for saying that. This was a man I loved so dearly. And that shook him like nothing else had that, that far. There'd been a slow erasing, a slow eating away of his self. But that, at, with such an intimate friend, that probably was the turning point when he realized the psychological bloodbath that had taken place within people. And that's what made him leave for Pakistan ultimately, where he was unhappy. 
He loved Bombay. And he was very, very active in Bombay with All India Radio, with his editing of newspaper magazines, with his uh, film scripts, film writing, etc., etc. So there is already a transformation of language. There's a violence in language, as you say, that's taking place that then gets reflected in Manto's writing. So later when he, he's put on obscenity trials, three before, three in India and three in Pakistan, three after he goes across, and he's being tried for obscenity all over. He's saying, you're, you know, you're disrobing people. You're, you're, you're putting forward a naked society. He said, the society has disrobed itself. It's become naked. I'm just putting forward. I'm just, I'm just showing you what's happening. And if you can't tolerate it, it's because it's become intolerant. So that violence that you see in Manto's language comes from the times in that sense. I don't think that um, Caitlin and Delan's relationship was violent. And it's violent on both sides. It's not that Delan uh, attacks Caitlin. Caitlin very often attacks Delan, right? But I think his... Some, I don't think it's in his poetry. I think his poetry belongs to a lyric tradition, which he has learned as well from his father's library. And that is not formed by their relationship whatsoever. I've never seen a, a, a disjuncture between uh, circumstances of someone's life and the, the, the art that you produce. One is not a contrast to the other. One doesn't live because the other is alive. I think they just seem to live syncretically, yes, side by side. Um, and his, his language is not violent. His language is dense, lyrical, pings away with all sorts of light and flow. Um, so he might be reforming languages. It's, it's somewhat in the, in the you know, we, we talk about the Welsh tradition of Cang Hanedd and putting words squeezed together. I think he's, he's in that tradition. And his, his reforming of language is entirely in this sort of, this kind of happy, sloppy, dog-like behavior that he had Portrait as a person. Portrait of the artist as a young yes. dog. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's something you mentioned, and uh, this is a question I want to put to the both of you, uh, which has to do with the personal life and the work that is created. Um, I have had to uh, grapple with this much more in, in, um, you know, in classrooms and in discussions with friends, particularly after the Me Too movement, where you know, once again, you've gone back to something we thought we had left behind, which was a kind of biographical criticism. Uh, the person who looms large in this is, is Woody Allen. Uh, you know, where, where you, you can no longer watch a film by Allen in that way. And I'm just trying to say, you know, in, in some ways, both, both Manto and uh, Thomas, uh, Dylan, uh, were, you know, great patriarchal, Men in that sense, you know, uh, certainly, I mean, they, uh, they took certain privileges for granted, although they had a softer, one hesitates to call it feminine side, but, but there, there was this in them. Uh, how, how, how do you see this relationship, especially since you've actually created a work of art on, on, on Caitlin? I mean, is the personal life at all important when we are considering the, the work of art, or should we just read the poetry or the short stories completely separately? from the lived life of that person. What if we knew nothing about these two people? Would the poems still work? Would the short stories still work? What do you think? Yes, they would. Um, I'm thinking of his relationship with his children, which um, Caitlin describes as sentimental, loving, as long as he didn't have to do the caretaking. <laughs> um, so I think it's essential in a way that you understand his poetry through that lens then, possibly, that in, in his letters are exactly the same, you know, oh, cat, cat, I love you, I love you, I'm so far from you, and all these, and you think, well, he writes that because he is far away from her, but when he is at home in the kitchen, they are both hitting each other's heads against the floor. So I think that's what is interesting, is about knowing about Delan's life, and Caitlin's life, and knowing about the poetry, is that you can see them within the same matrix, I think, rather than thinking, I take the poetry now, or, wow, look at that biography, you know? So I think if you can see both together, I think they're an essential counterpoint to each other. Incidentally, both of them had three kids each, uh, Dylan and, 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 and Sadat. So how would you? How would you? Uh, two very different things. I think uh, the point you brought up about uh, people in their private lives and uh, what their works tell us, and do we read them in, relationship, in relation to each other or extreme? Do we boycott them if they've been yeah. 
proven harassers, etc. That's something that will be going away from here, taking, taking away from this place. But uh, I think it's a very, very important question that we'll be need to be addressing in the future. Because uh, are we uh, going to look at, uh, are we also going to boycott people completely? Because if you're looking at a person, we keep talking about intersectionality. There's lots of people who call themselves intersectional feminists nowadays. But uh, of course, intersectionality has been there ever since the women's movement's been there because we've looked at uh, issues right across class, caste, etc. The question is that um, how are we going to handle this? Because as we keep saying, every individual has multiple sides to them. So what happens when somebody creates beautiful art but is downright abhorrent in his gender politics but may be great with his democratic politics? Mm. And these things are posing major problems because uh, as a, since we've come into this and it's important for us, I'll bring up this point. Um, I remember a lawyer friend asking recently when uh, there were five human rights activists arrested that there's a person who'd been boycotted by many of them because he'd been a proven harasser and they'd been telling him the least you can do is apologize. Ten years they hadn't talked. But when it came to the crux and you had to be brainstorming across the board and saying, okay, how can we save these guys? These are genuine people you need the greatest expertise you want. So one person picks up the phone and says, come and join the meeting. Now, the point is that do you completely boycott the person or are there other ways of reminding the person that this is something we will not tolerate, you bloody well transform yourself, but we will continue interacting where you're gonna be, uh, where, where, because we do share other politics also in common. So we are talking about intersectionality. We have to remember that we're talking about gender politics. We're talking about democratic politics. We're talking about caste politics, class politics, all of those. So we are in a very, very turbulent moment. And this storm was necessary. It has to continue for some more time. But we've got very tough questions coming up in the future. Uh, I think the point that we're talking about here vis-a-vis -vis Manto, um, you know, there's something similar here in terms of the contradictions of their lives. Not in the same way, but Manto loved Safia very dearly is the sense we get now. As Shamuntuk said, we knew very little about her. But um, Nandita Das thankfully went and met his sisters, to, found out about Safia, what she was like, what their relationship was like. And it's very, uh, what seems to be the case is that Manto had a lot of respect for Safia. Loved her dearly, had a lot of respect for her, and there was a lot of friendship in that marriage too. And hence, I think, also guilt in some ways. And loved his daughters dearly. So in a way, the tenderness and gentleness in his life that continued, the family was the basis of that. And if you read his writings, a lot of his writings are about a very, very deep wound to the human psyche. So where does that sensitivity come from? It comes from a rooting in relationships that are very precious. So I think, uh, yes, Manto was very upfront. He was almost brutal in his writings, but he wasn't brutal in the sense of he was creating the goriness. He was just reflecting very dispassionately, very objectively what's happening. But the fact that he could do that with such restraint, without... Um, Sugarcoating it is because I think he needed the wound to show. Yes, and he needed people to understand what they were losing out on. So I think there's a very complex relationship between his love for his wife and his daughters and the way he writes. Yeah. I think so we've come, to, this is very interesting to me because it seems to me that on the one hand you've got a man who had a very brutal, violent marriage in real, you know, in real terms, you know, violent with his wife, kids, and so on, and who wrote this very tender lyrical poetry. And you've got another man who's got this very tender lyrical relationship with his wife and kids, <laughs> who writes this very brutal stuff, you know. Uh, I think and he's still insensitive to his wife and kids. And, you know, and he's still insensitive he, to his wife and kids. <laughs> because he, he's putting them through hell, through his alcoholism and through his yeah, uh, yeah. wanderings. Yeah. I was going to come to the alcohol bit now, you know. Uh, you know, maybe we make too much of alcohol and maybe we read too much into to, to, to the alcoholism, uh, you know, whether of a, a Dylan Thomas or a Hemingway or, 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 or F. Scott Fitzgerald or a Manto or, or whoever. Um, but tell us about your experience of creating Caitlin. 
I knew more about Caitlin. Um, I, knew, uh, I knew very little about Caitlin before I started reading her books, and I realized I knew about two sentences about Delan, but I have learned th about Delan through Caitlin. Um, I knew she had been a lot of trouble because that was her reputation. And in reading her book, especially Double Drink, the story of her marriage with Delan and with alcohol, um, it gave me a real perspective on her because she has a real perspective on herself. Um, it was really valuable in that it gave us the format. In, the, in our production, we have an AA meeting. It's through that frame that we begin to understand Caitlin and that we begin to understand Delan. Um, it's entirely confessional and it's entirely very, very... Um, she understands herself really well in a way that I think possibly that Dylan might not have understood himself very well. He died when he was 39. She died when she was 81, 80, 81 I think. Yeah. Yes. And so she'd had yeah. 20 years in sobriety to understand her and to understand her marriage with her husband. That is the, the thing that we try to reflect in the show, but we try to talk about it from Caitlin's point of view to the extent that Dylan only has two words and two sounds in the, show, the whole show, what hello, Caitlin, at the beginning, and uh, and uh, later on. <laughs> so we were forced to do that simply because the estate probably would not allow us to use his poetry. Um, they might have, but we would have had to wait years to find out whether they would or not. And that's fair enough on the estate. We don't <laughs> mind. But then it gave us then the, the stricture the yeah. limitation of trying to make a poem in which you reflect and make a show in which you reflect his genius and without actually displaying the thing that he was a genius for. So that, that's one of the standout marks, I think, of the show. And the other thing is, is Caitlin's ability to reflect on herself. After that, the, the, the account of their relationship, um, because it is a dance production, is entirely physical. She was a dancer and that is why it was commissioned because of her... Uh, experience within the dance world. Um, so they commissioned two dancers then to make that show. Is this the kind of answer that you're looking for here when you talk about the process of making the show? Yes, yes, because uh, I, I was actually going to come to uh, the dance uh, choreography bit because it seems to me that you have three or maybe four texts as it were. There's first the text of their lives and the alcohol and the violence. Then there are the texts of the entire oeuvre of Dylan Thomas, and then there's your text. And the three have three different languages. Uh, one is words, obviously, the poetry. One is, you know, narration, events, houses, broken cutlery, smashed bottles of alcohol, the dead body on the slab. And the third is this physical thing that you do on stage. How much of the, the movement of the poetry, if you like, went into creating the movements. And he, because you use a lot of the floor, don't you? I mean, you know, lying and, you know, touching, sitting on the chair and, and so on and so forth. You know, that I might, I might describe to the audience really what, what we're talking about here. <laughs> we're talking about chairs and we're talking about floors. It's a circle in which there are 40 chairs, but only 20 of them are sat on by the audience. The rest are for our use as dancers. Um, and because it was a meeting and because it's an AA a meeting and because you sit and confess, that's the starting point. The chairs then are used to throw around, smash, uh, represent prams, represent hangovers, represent sexual revenge, all of those things. I would say that the poetry hasn't influenced any of the, the choreographic movement at all. Although the way that we assembled the choreography could be thought of as poetic, in that we didn't choose a timeline and we didn't choose a, prose a prosaic narrative. It's not in prose. So our, my choreographer, who's sitting in the middle here, would say, uh, think of the words scratch and sniff. So you pair <coughs> those two words. And so that makes us then do the action of he scratches me, I sniff him. So there, I would call that poetic rather than think of the situation in which this could happen and that you might say these words, that you might call a narrative line. So we put it together in what I, we might call poetic pockets of uh, randomized words fueled by the biographies. And then you assemble the narrative out of that rather than think of a, a prose narrative to begin with. So there's none of Dylan's poetry in it, but there's a lot of dance poetry in it. Thank you. And the sort of parallel question, I'm having fun, you know, asking parallel questions 
to two people. <laughs> you won't be able to do it people. for too long. No, 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 no. Uh, how much time do we have left? <coughs> just, just somebody indicate. But I wanted to ask you about the film mantra because again, you know, you have these these elements, the the words, the life, mm -hmm. and this new medium in which it's it's been trans. I mean, yeah. do you, do you think it's a good film, bad film? You know, would you recommend you know, people? I think <laughs> what's very interesting is that there was a film on Manto made in Pakistan a few years before this, and that one focused on his. I haven't seen it. I couldn't bear to see it because I uh, downloaded it the very same day I'd seen this Manto, and that one was in a completely different mode, and it was about his alcoholism and his uh, tenure in the psychiatric hospital. So I couldn't sit and see Manto in a psychiatric hospital after having seen Nandita Das's film. Uh, I liked the film because uh, for various reasons. One is I think uh, it actually went, she took the trouble of researching Safia and bringing out in more full-blooded form Manto's life in terms of his relationships. Another one was that uh, she actually uh, interwove, interwove the, uh, the scenes of the stories, Manto stories and Manto's times. So you get a strong sense of how his stories are actually reflecting his times. So there was a lot in the film that I liked, but uh, I think what I would like to actually come back to is the question of alcoholism and creativity, since we're talking about the Pakistani film being based in the psychiatric hospital. Uh, psychiatric hospital, alcoholism, psychic disturbance, psychological disturbance. I think um, there's a very, very deep historical grounding to all of this. This was no ordinary clinical depression that Manto was going through. This was no ordinary anxiety that he was going through. If we look at his life, he witnessed the Janya, he was seven years old when the Jallianwala Bagh took, incident took place. It impacted him deeply. He was in the throes of the civil disobedience movement and its excitement and its hope and its joy. What follows after that? You've got the partition and complete bloodbath. After that, the carnage, the communal carnage. Then he has to leave. I mean, I talked about his relationship with his friends, etc. He goes to Lahore. Wrong time to go to the Lahore film industry because most of the people from the Lahore film industry have come to India. That film industry has been deserted. So economically, he's a mess. So one after the other, the historical reasons that are making him feel helpless, and he turns to alcohol in that context. So it's not a clinical depression of that kind. Which is, all, what's also very telling is that his most famous story, one of his last, Toba Tek Singh, which has been, you know, rendered into several performances, films, etc., was written while he was in the psychiatric hospital. So his alcoholism was something he turned to to deal with his deep turbulence inside him, but that alcoholism was not something that stimmied his creativity, because some of his masterpieces are coming out at that time. So I think you'd be very wary of uh, those who actually say Manto had major psychological problems. They are historical problems, that he's dealing with an historical problems of a very great magnitude. Of course, they, Im uh, they uh, impact the psyche, but this is not a hormonal problem. So, I'm saying that, um, yes, alcoholism, I mean, alcohol does release one's in, one inhibitions. They cognitively disinhibit you. Alcohol cognitively can disinhibit you. You can write more freely. All of that is there. But I think here, this was a man who was turning to alcohol to deal with incredible horrors of his time. Horrors that could not be spoken, actually, and he was trying to speak them. So, um, I think the film cannot show those horrors. It took 50 years for the first film on partition to come out, except for Garam Hawa, which was shot indoors, Mammo, Earth 1947, all the films that talked about the carnage, that depicted the carnage, had to wait 50 years to come out. And even today, I don't think we're ready to see the horrors of carnage that actually took place because they are unprecedented on this subcontinent and in a large part of the world. So he was dealing with something very, very immense and it's incredible that he could exercise the kind of restraint he did in his writings to create what he did in that context. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe a couple of quick questions from the audience. 
Um, unless you want to say something more. No, I'm fine. Okay. A couple of questions from the audience. Do we have time for that? Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, questions, yeah. Sir, uh, I want to ask both ma'am about uh, Dylan Thomas' one poem that is the In My Craft of Salenut. Over there, uh, Dylan Thomas is mentioning that Salenut uh, is not about anything divine. It is about the pain, uh, pain is about the grief stricken process. So, how much is it related with the Manto's life if we compared the both of them? I, I think this is your. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember this point. No. As I said, I'm not a student of Dylan Thomas, really, at all. So, I mean, I'm just a way of, it's not a way of avoiding your question. But uh, my, my specialism, if I have a specialism, is Caitlin, really. Yeah. So, I can't answer questions about his, his craft and his poetry at all, I'm afraid. And I love some Dylan Thomas poems, but I haven't read a lot of them. And what I did, I read many, many years ago. So I'm sorry. This is one I can't refer to. Oh, I'm so happy that the question has gone unanswered <laughs> by two. Because it never happens. You know, you have so many answers, you get confused. And now you were confused There's to begin with, question. you will remain confused. Good on you. <laughs> okay. Uh, someone else there? You know? I, mean, I could try confusing you more, but I'm not <laughs> no, going to no, do stop, that. Stop, stop, stop. There's someone <laughs> yeah. else there. Right at the, right at the back. Maybe we should I never pretend the to be experts in, the blue t -shirt, so yeah. in things that <laughs> should not make up an answer for your yeah. question. Um, <laughs> Go on then. My question was regarding Dylan Thomas. And uh, Dylan Thomas has been known as this sort of rock star poet um, when he went to New York um, and in his other journeys in Wales. Um, and he sort of laid down the foundations of spoken word poetry, which we have today. Um, and a lot of his creativity came during the time of time when he was a complete alcoholic and I guess the same goes for Manto. I don't know much about him but through the conversations we had today we know that he was very troubled, he was in a very sad state of mind when he was writing. Um, so my question is, is it necessary in, in terms of poetry for a person to be sad or to be in a, in a state of grief? Because we don't read much about say happy poems or, when, or we don't conventionally associate writers with this sort of uh, being happy people in general, right? Uh, well, there, are, there are lots of writers like that. I'll, I'll tell you after the yeah. show. I, th I think you're right in that he appeals and his appeal is to a... Uh, it's, it's slightly morose, isn't it? And it's all about a certain loss and it's all about those elements in ourselves that we, that we like to um, yearn after something. Um, I think sometimes there is a sort of cloudy grey sky quality that, or necessity that poets have to feel that they are under or any kind of creative person. I think of it myself. I think of like, if, is, it a, is it a cloudy day? Well, yeah, I can go inside and do something. Then I can go inside and dance. You know, <laughs> Today's a good day. But I, I think, yeah, you, in poetry. a way you have to put yourself into some slightly miserable, mesmerized quality. As dancers, we didn't make it in a mesmerized, miserable quality. Uh, quality. We, 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 because we're physical, you, you don't get miserable when you're physical in the same sort of way. Um, and also because the, their stories were so harsh in a way that we, we spent most of our time laughing. So I think his process that you have described was quite different from the process that we experienced in describing their lives together. Kavita, your response to that? I think the question may carry some partiality in it. I could sit here and recite loads and loads of inspirational poems, nationalist poems, uh, left poems, romantic poems that are very happy poems or poems of, you know, collective joy, solidarity, etc. But I think uh, many of us do grow up thinking of poetry as something that's very, very intense. That's uh, because I think uh, what enables great poetry, it's an unusual experience, it's, it's an unusual way of understanding the world, it's intensity of experience. And a large part of our intensity is in the realm of sorrow. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why we associate uh, a lot of great poetry with sorrow or with uh, disturbance, turbulence, etc. But there's some wonderful poetry that's also extremely joyous and inspiring.
I think possibly that it comes out of this romantic 19th century. And he is, of course, he is still a 19th century poet in a way. He is carried on and on, you know, up into the, into the mid-century, the last century. I'm thinking of um, some medieval Welsh poetry, which is not of this quality. And I think poets of that time, they were also looking for patrons in the same way as Dylan Thomas was. But there was a system, you know, Erichelwyr, the high lords. They would travel between the houses and they would offer their services. This is not like the musings of an individual. They would offer their services, their writing services to that lord. So very often you get praise poems about the, the magnificence of the house and how wonderful your family is and everything. But you also get a lot of very funny poems by yes. a poet such as uh, David Ap William, who talks about, well, the poem is called Trouble in a Tavern, Trafir Mount Tavern, in which he describes sleeping in a tavern, having had his eye on this certain lady trying to sneak over to her room, falling over three English soldiers on the way and being chased out of the house. And that is all the poem is about. But it <laughs> is... I'm going to start too now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking it's possibly um, a hangover from the 19th century that we, that we still enjoy this um, idea of, of, of troubled poets. And, and, and with that, on the troubling note, we will have to end proceedings. I'm getting frantic. People in the home front are not good. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs>